we are back with another webinar as part of our 2023 CKF webinar series. This webinar will focus on mental health and transplant in honor of Mental Health Awareness Month. My name is Anna Morgan Pilardi. I am the Program and Communications Director for the Chris Klug Foundation, and I will be introducing today's panelists and moderating this session. Uh, I would first like to thank our generous sponsors, the Hearts for Rest Foundation, who helped make this series possible. Thank you to all of those who have submitted questions before today's sessions. If you have a further question for today's panelists, please send them to info at chrisklugfoundation.org and we will get them out to the panelists. Um, if you're interested in any other topics we'll be dis discussing in this year's uh, series, head to chrisklugfoundation.org slash DKF webinar series. Now, I would like to introduce our panelists. Uh, first up, we have Randy Stafford. Randy is a two-time uh, kidney transplant recipient based in Mill Valley, California. Randy is a CKF patient ambassador and works to spread awareness for organ eye and tissue donation through our programs. Next, we have Patrick Brett. Patrick is a heart and liver transplant recipient from Bluebell, Pennsylvania. Patrick is the newest member of our CKF patient ambassador team, joining in November of 2022. Um, next, we have Sharon Drost. Sharon is a double lung transplant recipient from Los Altos, California. As a physician, Sharon has experience on both sides of the stethoscope. And finally, we have Nicole Jefferson. Nicole is a kidney transplant recipient from Dallas, Texas, who I had the wonderful opportunity to meet in transplant games in San Diego, and I'm excited to hear her thoughts on this topic. Um, thank you all uh, for joining us today. It is great to see so many new faces part of the CKF team, and I'd like to get started with some questions. So first up, uh, I'm going to start with Randy. Um, learning you're in need of a transplant is extremely life altering. It's a complete, you know, 180. Um, can you talk a minute about how this affected your mental health? What feelings and emotions you experienced during your journey? Yeah, thanks for the question. You know, in my case, the diagnosis of kidney disease was particularly abrupt. I had gone through 23 years of life and had just gotten out of graduate school and started a new job. And as part of the pre-employment physical, I was found to have very severe kidney failure. And eventually this was discovered to be congenital, that I was born only with one very small kidney and that this kidney had essentially failed over the, the 23 years that I had been alive. And uh, basically went from feeling completely healthy maybe with a few signs in the background that something could be wrong, but I was very athletic through my childhood and teenage years and active in college sports. And then to suddenly be told that I would be on dialysis within a few months was really disheartening. And um, there was a, a real sense that my body had, uh, had let me down, that it it somehow had failed me very suddenly, even though this had been a, a problem that it had been identified as going back very early. I didn't know anything about this growing up. So, you know, my feelings at that time were disappointment and isolation. I think the other notable thing was that there was a tendency to try to blame myself. There was kind of as I was going through the diagnosis process, um, it took a long time. And during that time of uncertainty, I became prone to sort of look for things in my past that could have potentially caused my my kidney failure. Although in the end, it turned out that there was nothing that I could have done and uh, anyone could have done to sort of prevent this from happening. So that sense of depression and not feeling well, feeling down quite a few days, uh, was very unrelenting during that period. And in some ways, I happened upon two strategies to kind of fight that. One was exercise. I really stuck with this idea that I'd been very active previously, and even with kidney failure, I was going to remain active. Even if the physicians at the time really thought that that was crazy, that uh, they told me to take it easy and not stress my body, but that didn't feel right to me. And in some ways, I purposely ignored the 
the advice of my nephrologist. And then, frankly, the other thing that really helped is that I had this full-time job and I was really committed to sticking with it because it was the culmination of a lot of uh, training and my graduate school uh, education. And I so much wanted to hold on to that, even knowing once I got on dialysis that it was rare for dialysis patients to keep working. So for me, it was a very abrupt change, one that really completely shattered my illusions about who I was and what I was doing and put me into a, a whole mindset that particularly, you know, was, was not very helpful and, and quite, quite on the, on the depressed side. Does anyone have anything to add to Randy's comments? Maybe a journey that you went through? I was just going to say, I understand what Randy is saying about you feeling like your body let you down. Um, also, it, you go through and say, what did I do? What can I, what can I do now? What could I have done? Um, you know, was, did my uh, parents have any, you know, issues with this because maybe I wasn't checked out when I should have been. But ultimately, there is no, it's no one's fault. It's your, you know, just something that happens. Um, even with the birth defects and things like that, these are things that they don't necessarily go and test for unless they already know about them. So that's a whole, you know, that's one of the hurdles that you have to go through on this journey. I was just going to add that uh, I agree. For me, uh, my diagnosis was a complete um, surprise. I was very healthy, athletic. I'd finished medical school, all of my training. I had a, uh, a lovely four-year-old daughter. And my um, particular situation is I had uh, an autoimmune disease. It was called uh, scleroderma. And um, never had any other manifestations of it until one day I just couldn't push her stroller, a very loaded up stroller, by the way, up a hill in at the San Diego Zoo. And I thought, oh boy, this is, this is something serious. And so uh, as a physician, reached out to some of my physician friends and pretty much quickly um, had the diagnosis. And I did feel, I did feel that as a physician, I should have seen signs earlier. Um, and then my scleroderma did uh, essentially uh, destroy my lungs uh, pretty rapidly. So I needed the transplant uh, relatively quickly within about a year from diagnosis. I think, yeah, I think hindsight's a great thing in every part of the world, um, you know, of, of your life. And I definitely hear a lot more than I ever thought getting into this um, world. A lot of people say, well, I was perfectly healthy. It came out of nowhere. And I'm always so surprised, you know, how that occurs, but it so, happens to so many people. Um, you know, you're living life, you're going about it, and suddenly 180, your world's changed. Um, I'm going to move on to Sharon. Um, Sharon, often we talk with transplant uh, recipients who experience survivor's guilt. Is this something that you personally have experienced? Um, how do you learn to cope with, um, you know, survivor's guilt or something, you know, that like that? That's a great question. So survivor's guilt is a very individual uh, experience. Um, and I've taken a poll of patients, uh, and especially I have a group of uh, doctor friends who are also transplant recipients. And... Um, having the opinion of that group I value greatly because uh, they're in a similar situation to me where we all feel like we should have been able to diagnose our own problems earlier. Um, and then to be a survivor means that you live whereas someone else had made the uh, largest sacrifice in the world. Um, and another part about survivor's guilt is early on, it seems to be the worst. Because here you are laying in the hospital, able to fully breathe, no oxygen, no anything needed at all. Um, and in my case, uh, two doors down, uh, the lady who received my donor's heart also 
was um, was there. And so I had the opportunity to speak with her, to speak with her family, very grateful family. And it's something that seeing and talking to the family members and knowing the stories behind how much the families appreciate that the organs were used and they've gone to um, good people and they, they get a chance to even just see you. You don't have to keep in contact with them for very long periods of time if you don't want to or if they don't want to, it's their choice. Um, but it, it is a sense of closure and it's healing for, I think, both sides, for the recipient and the families. So I think uh, survivor's guilt is very personal. Um, it really seems to affect people early on and fades as you just go on. And I've had uh, friends who um, they've gotten married, they've had twin children, they have, you know, gone on in their training and, um, and some are transplant physicians themselves. Um, and it really points out that beyond that early phase of guilt, you realize that you're honoring your donor by living your life to the fullest. You truly are doing what they intended for you. And it makes both you and the family, I believe, feel best. Anyone want to add on to, to Sharon's comment there? Yes, I will. Personally, I didn't have any survivor's guilt um, the first time. Um, I mean, I knew this was just the circle of life and things happen. Um, I believe my sister had more guilt about the person who passed away with my first transplant. My guilt came in when I lost that transplant and I had to have another transplant. Um, and that's where I actually went through mourning for, for her. And it was more, it was a mourning for, I felt like I let her down. I felt like she was dying again. And that's where my guilt came in and my guilt. Um, and I still have some guilt, um, although I, I have the other transplant. But originally, no, it was when I felt I let her down um, by having to have another transplant. Randy, did you want to add to that? Yeah, I uh, I was going to say that I felt uh, survival's, survivor's guilt very acutely. Um, in the sense that I had grown very close to uh, another uh, a guy who was about my age in the chair next to me in the dialysis center. And I was on dialysis for almost a year before getting my, my kidney transplant from my uh, younger brother. Um, you know, I thought that my friend, my, uh, my co-dialysis uh, mate was gonna follow the same kind of path that I was. And he received his uh, kidney transplant about three months after I did and initially did really well. Um, but then things kind of fell apart. The, the kidney wasn't working and all of the strategies they were trying to use to get the his immune system to, to calm down weren't working. And unfortunately, he eventually took his own life. And it was very abrupt and traumatic for me. And of course, just that situation was traumatic in itself. But I yeah. was left with this tremendous sense of guilt of kind of just wondering why it was that somehow I did so well. And my friend who was, you know, equally resourced and had had the skills to navigate this, it just didn't work out for him. And uh I still, I still feel some sense of, of guilt around that time in my life, even though we're now talking, uh, you know, more than 35 years ago. Yeah, I think guilt is something, you know, it's, it's a very hard thing to work through. Um, and everybody around you can kind of see tr truly what is going on, whereas you get sort of bogged down with that, that feeling. Um, I want to touch back to what Sharon said, though, it is you know, truly it's a gift of life. And for those who are on the donor side, it can be a great way to still feel connected to your loved one and for them to live on. Um, my mother-in-law lost a son through um, suicide and her other son is now on the transplant wait list. And to see her sort of see both sides like that, she's like, well, the gift he gave is helping um, his brother and 10 years, oh, five years later, 
it's it's crazy how how it lives on um so patrick we often see that the transplant process can cause recipients to become anxious and stressed during everyday life post transplant um especially during the COVID pandemic, um, as the world was sort of put on pause, but also recipients were at that high risk um, level. Did you experience anxiety in your everyday life? How did you overcome this? So, I mean, that's a great question. And it's uh, interesting timing as I just had my, oh my gosh, um, almost, I guess, year and a half, almost two year follow up with um, transplant psychiatry. So, Hospital University of Pennsylvania, where I have my transplant. Every transplant patient sees transplant psychiatry on a on a right you know, post transplant. A couple times they pop in, have conversations. Um, if they need to prescribe medication, anti anxiety medication, they would do such. And then um, you know you follow up as needed. And I just had my follow up yesterday, and, and just kind of going through what transpired immediately post-transplant and then now after I'm a couple months shy of two years post-transplant. So right after transplant was just a very interesting time for me. You know, I, I lived in the hospital for six months waiting for transplant, being extremely cautious during the pandemic. Um, my wife was able to work from home until she was, until I was fully vaccinated so that she came down and see me. I saw my kids three times in person. I'm sorry, four times in person, twice in the hospital. They snuck them in the hospital. They actually helped me out with that during transplant. So a lot of emotions after transplant coming home and also trying to, to even get home. Um, I put a lot of pressure on myself post-transplant to get better as quick as possible. And I blame myself for not being able to do so. I, I, I talked to myself and said, you, you sat in the hospital for six months and didn't, didn't mentally prepare yourself and just physically prepare yourself to be able to come out of this and, and, and be as, recover as quickly as possible as I had in previous years with open heart surgeries or uh, ICD implants. Now, granted, they were years prior, and I, as I got older, I was 35 when I had my transplant. Um, but what it turned out to be was that it was medication changes that were causing me to not progress in my recovery. So having to understand that, using transplant psychiatry to understand it was very helpful. They ended up putting me on a medication called Buspherum, which is anti-anxiety. Um, I'm still on that today, which is very helpful. Um, but as far as the, the pandemic goes and being high risk, um, those first couple of weeks and months back here at home were, were very anxiety. I mean, who could come visit? If they came visit, if they came to visit, they had to wear a mask, they had to wash their hands, they just you know Purell, all that kind of stuff. Um, you know, my parents, my sister, her kids, where were they prior to come visiting me and all that kind of stuff? And luckily it was the summer, so no one was really indoors, everyone was outside. But there was definitely some, some anxiety. And then my wife went back to work um, at a high school, at the biggest high school in the state of Pennsylvania. We have 3,000 students for, for three grades. Um, so her going to work, my kids going back to school, everyone was still masked at the time, but it was, it was definitely had some, some uh-oh, here we go. Are they, they going to bring something home that's going to put me back into the hospital where it works? Um, and as I got healthy and I, I went to cardiac rehab, there was always the, all right, there's only a couple people here, but who knows where they've been. Um, we didn't go out to dinner. We didn't go out to a restaurant or anywhere for months and months on end. Um, and that first time we finally did, it was, it was you know, it, I, I was, my wife had to like calm me down and say, relax, like you're okay. You, you know, you can take your mask off the eat, you'll be fine. And then I finally went back to work in January of 2022 and everyone was still masked, masked at the time, but now they're not. So my anxiety of that is definitely gone significantly down, but there's still that, I still have the plexiglass up around my desk. I still wear a mask to work every single day. Um, and, and students, high school students and, and, and any kind of K-12 student and, and even college students are very, uh, germ filled 
So I do my best to make sure that I protect myself to every degree possible um, to make sure that my anxiety for that is not as high as it, as it could be. Yeah, I can't imagine how hot it would be, you know, being in a high school. Yeah, they're definitely bringing in all the gems and having two two kids at home, you know, for them seeing you go through it, but also probably there's an element of you feeling, you know, you want to get outside, you want the kids to experience the world, but also containing your own risk at the same time. Uh, so the next one, I'm going to go to Nicole. Um, a transplant leads to significant both physical and mental changes that can be positive and negative. Um, do you feel there is a process to learning your lo- learning to love your post-transplant self again? And sort of what did that journey look like for you? Sure. So... I will say that uh, my first transplant experience was not a very good one. I crashed into dialysis. Uh, I had no idea anything was wrong with me. I went through the to the emergency room and I was on dialysis the next day. Um, so with that, I didn't have much information. I wasn't prepared. As soon as I found out I needed a transplant, that was my goal, get a transplant. I didn't care in between that time about dialysis. I didn't care about anything else really besides getting a transplant. Um, So after I received that transplant, I thought everything was going to go back to normal. I was going to go back to the way I was. It was, I thought, okay, I'm getting a transplant. I'm cured. It's over. I didn't realize that, no, I was not cured. A transplant is just another form of treatment. It's, you know, as I explained to people, a transplant is just like dialysis without going to the clinic um, every every three days a week. Or as I did it, peritoneal dialysis every night. That's the only difference. Um, So I actually struggled with that first one. And with that first one, because I didn't do well, I felt worse with the transplant initially. Um, And so I started thinking, should I go back on dialysis? What should I do? Because I don't like this feeling. However, I was working. I had a child to raise. So I continued to do that. And so I knew I had to keep going, keep going. And so it was a few years after that, that um, I moved to a different state. I moved to Iowa. And once I moved to Iowa, uh, all of a sudden I was in, I felt like something came awakened me and it was just a new feeling. And so that's when I started feeling good. But also that was the time in which I started advocating. And once I started advocating, I realized I was not the only person who went through this. And it was good having friends who I could explain things to, and they completely understood where I was coming from. Not that, um, you know, my friends that I have and my family, they want to, you know, they, they listen, they can empathize, but they don't understand. And so once that world opened, things got better for me. Um, and so I did use the, my transplant friends as a coping mechanism. And also, uh, um, you know, for my mental health. When I lost, when I started losing that transplant, I had a lot of, um, that's where the mental things started again. Number one, I've always had to advocate for myself because my doctor didn't believe that my transplant was failing. And he said that the numbers were in line with what they needed to be. So I begged him for a biopsy and he refused. And so finally, I told him, well, I'll, you know, go back to Texas. They'll do a biopsy for me. I've already called them because there's something going on. I know the paper says one thing, but this is not really what's going on. And um, I remember I was it was 2016. I was on my way to the transplant games of America in 2016. And uh, my doctor called and he said, you know, your body, don't you? I said, yes, I do. What, what is it? And he said, yeah, that kidney is 90 percent scarred. And I said, wow. So, again, my paperwork didn't show that. My numbers showed that it was okay. It was in line. My creatinine was at a two something. So with that, I was able to start being listed. And so because I had been an advocate for so long, I had a 
just a wide knowledge of information. Um, because I, you know, volunteer with, you know, NIH, NIDEK, I have, um, nephrologists on speed dial. So I was able to navigate this transplant, uh, thing a little bit better. Uh, at that time, I under, by then I knew and I found out things that I didn't know the first time. I knew I could get on any list I wanted to be on <laughs> pretty much. So I went and got on several lists around the country. Um, but that again, in itself, it's emotional because I was on, I was being uh, evaluated at five, di five different centers. So the rules were different at five different centers. One of the centers in particular had, um, they did not want to put me on the transplant list because my EGFR was not low enough. And we all know that e EGFR and the black people, uh, story. So that was upsetting, very upsetting. Um, because, you know, my, I would go back and forth and say, list me as a white person and my EGFR would be low enough for you to list me. And they said, we can't do that. And I asked them, well, how do you know I'm black? Are you basing that on visual? You don't, you don't know. And of course, you know, I was telling them like, that's an antiquated number. That's information that you got from slavery times when muscles were stronger. I don't have muscles. I can trust me. I don't. So you can't times my number by 1.5. So that started an entirely, um, although other, other centers were listing me. This is a very large medical center in the United States that Everyone thinks is the best center in the world and they look up to. So that was extremely hard, heartbreaking that they told me no. So while I'm getting yes from all these other centers, it was that one no that was just very upsetting. And it, that made me feel as though you're taking my race and you're saying no based on my race. Um, instead of just saying no because I haven't done everything. I've done everything that you've asked with the exception of having that correct EGFR. Um, so again, uh, while this was going on, my kidney was continuing to decline and of course still producing good numbers, but I could feel it. And that's how I knew I was in de decline in any way. I could just feel it. It was like, like she was telling me she was tired and ready to go. So, um, during this time, I ended up moving back to Texas, you know, to be closer uh, to family and, you know, the, the emotions there. The saving grace with this is um, the transplant friends that I had who told me, keep it going. You got it. And also me having to fight the doctors with um, not going on dialysis. Because when I moved to Dallas, they pretty much demanded that I start dialysis. And I told them I wouldn't start dialysis um, because it wasn't time. I would know when it's time for me to start dialysis. At this point, of course, they're looking at numbers um, uh, because the numbers were going up. And I told them I will not go on dialysis. This was in 2018 when I moved back to Dallas and they kept demanding. And so finally, my doctor got upset. <laughs> Send another doctor in to work with me um, because I was just adamant I wasn't going. And so in March of 2020, when COVID started, I told him, I said, OK, I feel it's time, but I have a lot of things coming up. I had a lot of advocacy uh, events to attend in D.C. So I said, I'll start dialysis in July. I, I promise you I'll start dialysis in July. Um, but again, I had put it off from 2016 to 2020. And so uh, that was in March when I was getting my letter about COVID, about, you know, not having to go into the office. And then in April, April 23rd, I got the call from Des Moines saying, hey, we think we have a kidney for you. You want to come and get it? So I was like, sure, I'll come and get it. So, um, of course, I flew up there, picked up the kidney. But again, everything is tied into um, emotional. It was April 2020. So we all know where we were as a country. Uh, COVID. No one knew how to react. No one knew. No one knew how to react. No one knew how to respond. They didn't know if anyone could fly up there with me. 
They didn't know how uh, everything was going to go on because it was new for everyone, especially someone coming from out of town. So I was able to, you know, to get the kidney and I did, you know, fairly well and stayed there for a while. And it, my original kidney, I could still felt like it was still working. She was still chugging along a little bit, but I still, you know, I went through the morning, as I said before, I started mourning like, oh my gosh, she's been with me for 12 years. I can't believe this. No, I can't let her go. And I would just, you know, at night, sometimes I would cry and just tell her, I'm sorry. I'm so, so sorry that, um, that you're dying again. I, I hope you don't think I failed you. Um, I tried, I tried and, you know, I got the sense of relief. And so the new kidney was coming in and, you know, having some issues. So I would, you know, I felt like she was just staying long enough to teach him the ropes. I said, hey, please teach him the ropes and <laughs> teach him about me. So um, you can you can rest like I, like I know you want to rest. And people think it's crazy, but I I I felt when the handoff took place. I could feel spiritually, mentally, when she handed it off to him completely and said, you got it from here, um, which was difficult because, again, this is something that had been with me. Although she's still in there, but, you know, she had been working with me for, for that long. And so that was that was extremely emotional. That was so powerful. And I definitely agree with you. There's nothing more, you know, having your friends and family is so important, but having that transplant connection to recipients, to those going through it, those who've been through it, um, there's nothing more powerful than that. I wanted to, Sharon, Randall, do you have anything to sort of add there? I so much agree with Nicole and uh, particularly with the, that sense that you're suddenly you're suddenly controlled by these rules that are restricting you. And some of the rules kind of make sense, but some of them are, are kind of like just tradition and physicians can be very dogmatic about what they think is correct for you. And, uh, you know, a lot of the research I do um, as a professor is on this idea of trying to get patients to advocate for themselves. And I think that's absolutely critical for transplant recipients because there are so many rules and restrictions and it is so complicated that we should be at the front line trying to do the most we can to uh, work ourselves into the conversation about what happens to us. And unfortunately, I, I found through my, you know, almost 40 years of, of dealing with kidney disease that um, that happens less often than we really would like. And I, I truly think um, that there are times when we have to essentially be non-adherent to, to say, I appreciate your advice, but I'm going to do something a little bit different because that's what I feel is what needs to happen with me. And unfortunately, I think that comes about because clinicians don't necessarily have the flexibility to kind of fine tune things around individual needs. And, uh, and also many patients are completely intimidated by the, the healthcare system. And, you know, I have a kind of interesting story because, you know, I was uh, in public health prior to my first transplant. And then decided to go back to medical school and as a clinician got my second transplant and it was such a different experience because I, I so much knew what was going on and I knew uh, how to manage the, the healthcare system, the nurses and the clinicians so that it was really centered on me. Um, and yet I still find that there are instances where clinicians don't quite get it. And one interesting anecdote from my, my recent experience is that uh, I was in the hospital and being interviewed by the transplant nephrologists. They were absolutely astounded 
that I was still working. They truly expected to be on, be on disability. And it seems to me that one of the issues out there is that we need to have a healthcare system that is asking patients to have aspirations. And sometimes that, that simply doesn't happen. And uh, I so much enjoy Nicole's story about how her advocacy really put her in this position of, of being able to have some say in her, her health care. Thank you. And Randy, one of the things that um, I just wanted to say uh, in regards to one of your comments, I've recently found that only about 30 percent of re transplant recipients continue to work. Uh, you are correct. They expect us to to not, you know, to, to be disabled and go on disability. Uh, while that just doesn't work for some people, I, it doesn't work for me. I have to work. <laughs> I have to work. Also, as a well, as a physician um, and a, a neurologist at that, um, I advocate for people to keep mentally active. It helps to ward off dementia, et cetera, things of that nature, um, and also physically active. And I can't underscore um, how important it is to be your own advocate because, Nicole, you know your body. Uh, Randall, we all, we know what's happening inside. Um, and it's really important. I think clinicians do have the best of intentions. It is a very demanding um, uh, job in terms of, um, you know, they oftentimes in the transplant um, medicine field in particular, they have a responsibility and an uh, obligation to the patients, but also to the uh, donors and to make sure that they uh, distribute the, or the organs to the best candidates. Um, but that said, again, I just want everybody out there to listen carefully. You have to be your own advocate. And as a physician, I love when patients tell me, listen, something's wrong. And then from there, I can run, run with it. But must speak up. You must keep a, a close eye on yourself. Even, you know, enlist the, your friends. Are you starting to look puffier? Are you just anything, anything and everything? Because you are a team with your transplant uh, center, physicians, et cetera. So really advocate for yourselves. Well done, Nicole. And I think this kind of fits into the discussion of mental health because I think most transplant recipients are very intimidated by that healthcare system out there. And um, that just adds to the sense of burden and the sense that, um, you know, I'm, I'm not doing well and that I'm not being heard. And in my mind, it's really important to sort of be open to what the healthcare system can give you, but also be actively managing your own care. And I think around mental health issues, there's an, an additional barrier, which is often kind of the social stigma attached to mental health. Um, but there, I think that there's a lot that patients can do to both engage with care and as you were suggesting uh sharon to you know eat a good diet be physically active get enough sleep those things which we actually know help with depression you know although we tend to think about talk therapy and antidepressant medications there still is a lot that patients can do to, to help their mental health i agree and randy just just to really uh, emphasize that point about sleep and mental health um, and exercise, I, I really can't, it's so, it's so tied together. You get a little serotonin bump, you feel better when you exercise. For me, I call it exercising my lungs because I'm a double lung transplant recipient. So I take my lungs on walks. I exercise all the time, mostly, and it's not for looks it's not for weight it's to keep the lungs working functioning optimally um, it also I always feel great after I exercise and uh, sleep it's challenging especially sometimes for people who are on prednisone which is one of the immunosuppressant medications but I have found ways and I'm interested also in Nicole and Randy and, and, and Patrick ways that you guys have found 
to um, help with insomnia. Uh, and for me, I use um, the Calm, C-A-L-M app. And uh, it has meditation, but also sleep stories, just like bedtime stories. Your, your mom, dad would tell you at night and you just fall right asleep. Uh, there's Headspace that also has mental health meditations and sleep stories and another one called Better Health. And I really recommend that pre-transplant patients start now. Just become familiar with the meditation practices, the sleep practices, sleep hygiene is so important. And that will set you up for uh, reduced anxiety, I think. Uh, and at least for me, I felt like I could control somewhat my anxiety when my pre-transplant, when my breathing was really labored, I had ways to visualize breath coming in and out, and it really helped. And it also helped post-transplant, the acute like day after transplant, just to be able to uh, feel like I could control that renewed sense of being able to breathe freely. It was so, it was like having a sports car <laughs> set of lungs and needing to know how to use them again. And so I really recommend um, in advance, just start um, becoming familiar and having those resources available to you. Join a gym if you need to. Have a walking buddy, um, whatever it takes. I think um, when we look at the mental health aspect and counseling, one of the things, especially when we're looking at the kidney community, a lot of people, um, a lot of black people are on dialysis because, you know, we're the main ones. And it's uh, taboo a lot of times to go to what they call, you know, the old people in our culture called a talking doctor. Um, and they would say, you're, you're crazy if you're going. And I always say it keeps you from going crazy is what it does. Right. <laughs> but um one of the things I think is, you know, we have to get past that and we have to understand that we need someone who can talk to who's actually in the field, not necessarily going to these pastors uh, who don't have the train, the the education behind their counseling or things of that nature and basing it on, you know, their beliefs. You have to go to someone on the outside. But we do. You need that that help. You need that type of, you know, to be able to talk to through things like Sharon has discussed, the exercise, the sleeping well um, and all of those things. Like she said, I use uh, one of the app that she does as well, but I use it mainly just to kind of track my sleep habits. And I do the unconventional and I go to sleep with uh, podcasts that are not like murder podcasts. <laughs> So um, that you have to know how you can go to sleep. Right. And so uh, that's that's how I, I go to sleep. But you're right. You have to find ways that you can go to sleep so you can get the sleep that you need in order to to keep going in order for your body to keep going. And I don't think a lot of people understand how much sleep is important. Sleep is important to your health. We all understand about how, how important it is to eat, but there are so many people who don't understand sleeping. They don't understand uh, dental care, you know, for your health. And there are a lot of things that come together um, in order to make sure that your health is together all around. There's definitely so many aspects that go, go into it. Um, I did want to sort of touch that we are doing, going back to Randy's point of, um, you know, not understanding what your doctor's telling you, learning those things. We had an interesting conversation a few webinars back where someone said, I broke it up with my support group. I said, you're in charge of researching this and you're going to research this and we're going to go in there and we're going to know what that doctor's talking about. And if you are feeling that you don't understand what's going on or you need a little bit of help becoming your own advocate, we are doing a understanding the medical talk webinar session, um, a few down the road. So tune into that one as well. Um, but everything you all just said, health, sleep, activity. Um, and I really enjoyed that uh, car uh, sort of nod there, Sharon. So many people say it's like a new engine going in. It's, it's, I felt completely, I've heard that one so many times. Um, I'm like, I've got to get on this car thing. Everybody's on it. <laughs> okay. Um, this is sort of for everybody now. 
um, feel free to jump in. Relationships with those around you alter during um, and after your transplant. Can you elaborate how your relationships with your loved one changed and how someone can maintain a healthy and positive re- relationship through the process and afterwards? Well, I think that's a, a really difficult question because there's no doubt that all of the changes, both physically and emotionally, that one goes through with the transplant are going to alter your relationships. And uh, that was that was really true for me because leading up to being on dialysis and while I was on dialysis, it was really difficult to keep things going in a relationship. And uh, I felt like my energy had to focus on keeping myself healthy. I was working, so that was an additional, you know, kind of burden. So there was a period of time when I, I kind of said, well, I just need to take care of myself. And, uh, you know, I think things in the end worked out, but it was an additional stress on me to sort of have that, that pressure and, um, and not really know what to do because I didn't necessarily have people in who had gone through transplant who uh, who were there to advise me. And I think things are maybe a little bit different now, but I think there's still a lot of stigma around kind of caring for our mental health or even, you know, getting couples counseling to care for, you know, the relationship. So part of the pre-transplant process is there is a, um, there is a, a psychiatric evaluation um, that is looking for a, a number of different things. And I am uh, now 10 years post double lung transplant. Yay. And uh, all is well. And I've had a really uh, very uneventful course. Again, the sleep, the exercise, staying mentally um, active and healthy and as happy as can be um, has definitely contributed to that. But as Randy was saying, there are times that you basically, when you're, especially in the first three months post-transplant, at least for me, because the lung transplant is, it's a huge capacity in your thorax, um, very large, um, you know, incision, and then across, uh, you become a burden to your family. And so my transplant center, part of my contract, it was a contract. Um, with my transplant center is to have two non-paid 24-7 dedicated caregivers at home that did not include my spouse. So I had my parents um, fly over from New York to California and stay, and it was wonderful. And I also remembered to honor them and give them days and weekends and whatever, date nights, etc., to keep their mental health going. And we all came through it well, but it took a lot of planning in advance. So if you do have the opportunity, if you're a pre-transplant patient, really reach out and, and um, figure out ways to, to surround yourself with a bubble of people who are not queasy, <laughs> who, who you know will be there for you, rain or shine. And um, it's, it's when you have ups and downs, they can be there for you. And likewise, you can be there for them. And I think it makes a really beautiful partnership, but I think planning ahead helps. And um, uh, undoubtedly you will have, you know, ups and downs post-transplant, but having that bubble of love around will really, really help. And Sharon, um, I think, it, you know, everything you're saying is correct. I just wasn't aware of that with my first transplant. And I think, honestly, I was upset. It was disheartening because after my first transplant, my family my family thought everything was back to normal. They didn't understand that there was all of these other things were going to still go on. I was going to still be sick. Um, I still couldn't do certain things. Uh, some some In some instances, things got worse. So that was very, um, that was hard to deal with because at that point, the beginning of that, I really didn't have anyone to, to, to talk to um, because I didn't get into advocacy too much later. But of course, with this second one, um, I was fine. Relationships didn't change. Uh, I don't, I've learned to stop expecting 
expecting things from people who don't understand. And it's of no fault of their own. It's just, this is nothing. They've never been through this. So while I know they love me, I know they care about me. There's no way they can understand what I'm going through. So this second time around was, you know, very helpful that I have so many transplant friends that I could talk to. I could tell them how I felt and they could really understand, not just say, oh, I'm sorry you're going through that, but they could say, oh, wow, we'll try this. Or, oh, when I had my transplant, this happened or that happened. So uh, I don't, uh, with me, I don't think any relationships changed. I think it's it's so different for everybody and it just depends on your support network and, and who's around you and how, you know, familiar they are with the transplant process, what you're going through. Um, and yeah, I can't read it or reiterate Nicole's point. Find those in the transplant community. Um, if you're happening to watch this, CKF can help. Donor Alliance, uh, Donate Life America, your local OPO. There's lots of opportunities out there for us to connect you with somebody who necessarily isn't going through exactly the same thing, but has gone through a transplant and has those similarities to talk to you about. Um, Okay, we're moving on to our final question. Uh, what support systems can transplant recipients and their families put in place to ensure a healthy physical recovery, but also a healthy mental recovery? Um, are there specific tools that each of you use to help you through that process? I know we touched on it a little bit, but just want to put some focus on it. Well, I'm also a big advocate of the uh, of using the uh, meditation or story time apps because I think that it's a it's very much a a different way of approaching your life and uh, I think really helpful. As I said before, I really think that there's a whole range of, of things that people can do to keep themselves healthy mentally and physically. Um, but it's also important to recognize just how common mental health issues are. And, uh, you know, maybe they are more common in the transplant recipient community, but these are common throughout, you know, society. I would say that among my patients, certainly 25 or 30 percent have some level of mental health issues around anxiety or depression or adjustment to events in their lives. So this is something that that all of us share in some ways with lots of other people and kind of this sense that we're in it together, I think is very helpful to remember and takes away from this idea that this is something that we should keep hidden and no one should know about. And that, um, and, you know, I think we need to get over that, that stigma that is still out there, I think diminishing, thankfully, but still out there. I really agree, Randy. And uh, again, my transplant center, there was a pre um, psychiatric uh, evaluation, but 10 years ago, there was no, <laughs> absolutely no post psychiatric support. And I did advocate for myself and thought, well, no, I'm, I'm a physician. I can take, I have handled so many things, you know, um, but I did find that I didn't want to burden my spouse. I didn't want to burden the people closest to me. Um, and I needed someone external to the family to speak with, someone with training, someone with understanding about transplant um, physiology and, and mental health and support. And so I advocated for that um, and found uh, someone who I, I talk to regularly. And it, it's, it's really just refreshing uh, to have someone knowledgeable who can, um, when, for instance, uh, I'm having a, a rougher time with insomnia, which happens to just be my main issue post-transplant, um, you know, she comes up with these great suggestions and things that I've never thought of and other patients have, you know, brought to her attention. And it's a partnership. It really, really helps. And again, Randy, Randy as you were mentioning, you know, generalized anxiety disorder is, is pervasive throughout society, um, not just the transplant community. And it's something that, again, I, I would love for people to prepare themselves um, uh, to be ready to have resources 
um, basically on your telephone. <laughs> it's as simple as that. Nobody, you can use it any time of the day. But also, if you can find, establish uh, a caring relationship with a, um, a psychologist or a psychiatrist who is knowledgeable in transplant uh, um, issues, that would be so helpful. Oh, and also, also, as Nicole mentioned, having the transplant um, groups, other patients who have gone through this, it's invaluable because you'll, you'll learn little tiny tips. Like, for instance, I'll, I'll share one. Um, I really set up my, my home, my bedroom, my pillows, my everything so that if I needed to lay on it, whichever way I needed, I had a pillow for it. And it, it sounds, it sounds weird, but just little things like that um, really, really helped um, to make the transition from hospital to home and then the recovery really, really helpful. Yeah, I just want to, uh, they've said it all. Randy and Sharon have said it all. You know, one of the things that I want to reiterate is making sure that you have someone you can speak with, speak to who's not a family member, someone who's who has been trained in counseling and therapy, uh, someone who's going to give you that outside opinion without pulling any type of uh, spiritual lessons into it based on what they believe. Um, that's that's really important, in my opinion. My counselor has been, you know, phenomenal, you know, all along the way. And as he stated, he's learned so much because. He was with me before the second transplant and then going through the second transplant with me. He learned a lot about uh, kidneys. He learned a lot about dialysis. He learned a lot about transplant. And it's just, um, it's been amazing having him along. Uh, and again, like I said before, I listen to podcasts, Christina Randall, Annie Elise, people like that to <laughs> help calm me, believe it or not. But um you know, one of the things you want to do is make sure that you're you're calm, make sure that you're not stressed. That's one of the things that we sometimes forget, forget about and we let ourselves get stressed, especially, you know, when it doesn't directly affect us anyway. And it took me a long, it took me 50 years <laughs> to finally stop doing that. Um, but finding something to do. That's another thing. Um, right. Uh, sorry. So finding something to do. That's another thing. Um, Last year, when I turned 50, I realized, OK, what next? I'm about to go into the last chapter, the last chapters of my life. So I decided to go back to school, get a master's. I decided to uh, learn sign language. Learn, so I started learning sign language. Um, now that I'm about to graduate, <laughs> I'm like, I'm asking people, what next? What do I want to do next? I think I'm going to do, uh, I think we're going to go learn how to dance or something like that because I've never been able to dance in my life. Um, but I, I'm enjoying life now. Um, it's just, uh, it's, it's really good. It's really good. Thank, thanks to transplant. Thanks to this donor and, um, thanks to everything that, that comes along with it. I love that pushing yourself outside of that comfort zone. It's so important and, and to do different things. But also I do want to sort of add on to that. Um, each of your journeys is your own. And while we're all sitting here and saying, you know, this is very much what worked for every person on here. And just remember that always your journey may not look quite the same. You may have a different goal in mind. Um, doesn't make it any less important. And, you know, we have a lot of people with Chris, you know, being an Olympic athlete who go, well, I got out and I tried to do with Chris and get back on a stationary bike and back on a snowboard and I put my stitches right open. And I'm like, just because Chris did that does not mean that that is your journey. Um, make sure that you are striving for your sort of gold medal or whatever that looks like for you. Um, so... That is it for today's session. So I want to thank everybody here, all of our panelists for sharing your journey. And um, thank you all for tuning into today's session. And we hope you found it inspiring, informative. Again, if you have any questions for today's panel or want to learn more about this year's webinar, head to chrisklugfoundation.org uh, slash CKF webinar series. We hope you have a great yes, rest of your day. Uh, stay safe, stay healthy and live life, give life. 